sitting for a little bit. Let's all stand together to sing it. 138, oh come all ye faithful. Brother Bob. Oh come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Oh come ye, oh come ye to Good singing, and again, a great job by the young people tonight, and uh, really enjoyed it, and uh, quite a production, really, and uh, a lot of stuff involved in that, and uh, they did a wonderful job. Thanks for staying for the service, and uh, let's pray together, shall we? Father, we bow before you in prayer, and we thank you, Lord, for this evening, and already what we've heard, and Lord, the tremendous job by the children, and the focus on Christ at Christmas, and how so many things we can look at that will point us to him. And I pray, Lord, that uh, you'll be pleased now with the service that we gather together for here this evening. Lord, I pray that once again Christ would be the focus, that he would be lifted up, and that all of us would be drawn closer to him because we were here this evening. So, Lord, bless the music, bless our fellowship together, honor the preaching of your word. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Would you turn with me, please, to 361, 361, walking in sunlight all of my journey. Heavenly sunlight, 361, let's sing that first together. Walking in sunlight all of my journey, over the mountains, through the deville. Jesus has said, I'll never forsake thee, promise divine that never can fail. Heavenly sunlight. Heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing his praises, Jesus is mine. Shadows around me, shadows above me, never conceal my Savior and God. He is the light, in him is no darkness, ever I'm walking close to his side. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing his praises, Jesus is mine. In the bright sunlight, ever rejoicing, pressing my way to mansions above, singing his praises, gladly I'm walking, walking in sunlight. <laughs> heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah. Sing, singing his praises, Jesus is mine.
Now some announcements. Listen carefully if you would. And uh, our regular schedule as far as the week goes. And, uh, of course, we have the Christmas banquet tomorrow night out at Dear Dutchman. That will be a great time. And uh, remember, the door is open about 630, I think, and it's 7 uh, we commenced to eating, all right, and uh, we're always a great time, and we're looking forward to a good time together tomorrow night. Then Wednesday night, right here for our midweek service at 7 o'clock, uh, and the children's clubs will be meeting as well during that time, and uh, Wednesday, 7 p.m. Saturday morning, we'll be going Christmas caroling, all right? Uh, we go to a, a nursing home or two, and uh, also I think I'd like to go over to the select hospital there, and we'd like to go sing for Paula Ross uh, during that time. So we're going to try to do that Saturday morning. And uh, so we'll leave at 10 o'clock sharp Saturday morning, all right? So make sure you uh, plan to come for that. There is a sign-up sheet downstairs if you'll sign up for that. Uh, if you just bring some cookies with you for uh, others to share, uh, Christmas cookies, Fellowship Hall, Oreo cookies, last office on the left, okay? <laughs> and we'll be taking care of those for you, all right? And uh, we'll have a good time on Saturday, Christmas caroling. Then remember, next Sunday evening at 6 o'clock will be the Hope of Christmas, the choir, the alt choir, and a dramatization. And uh, you will enjoy that. Great, great cantata, great message to it. So uh, plan to be here next Sunday evening. Notice the special time. Again, it's 6 p.m. Uh, next Sunday night. All right. And we'll take a moment. Anybody visiting tonight? Anybody here for the very first time? I know we have some folks here that came to see grandchildren and nieces and nephews and such. Uh, anybody here, this is your very first time at Bible Baptist? I think so. All right. We have an anniversary to celebrate. John and Cheryl Polehable. Just been married 46 years. I think what a, yeah, somebody said, what a woman to stay with John 46 years, amen, but uh they probably went home on the couch, and she said, you used to sit close to me. Yeah. <laughs> you have to have been here this morning to understand that one. But uh, we so appreciate the poll labels. They were saved at this church, baptized at this church under Pastor Rock, and uh, just so good to have them here in our church. And we're so thankful that they're celebrating 46 years together. Isn't that great? And um, Sing happy anniversary. Congratulations. That's great, isn't it? All right. Take your songbook. Let's all sing again together. Number 337, 337. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, trust and obey. 337. On that first together. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he shed on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Let's sing that third. Not a bird and we pair. Not a sorrow we share, but our toil he doth richly repay. Not a grief nor a loss, not a frown or a cross, but is blessed if we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in to trust and obey. 
on the last, then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at his feet, or we'll walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do, where he sends we will go, never fear, only trust and obey, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Amen. Great singing tonight. Let's turn over to the front again. 142, 142, O little town of Bethlehem. How still we see thee lie. Would you stand with me as you find? One, four, two. On that first all together. O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Above thy deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by. Yet in thy dark streets shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years in thee tonight. For Christ is born of Mary and gathered above. While mortals sleep, the angels keep their watch of wondrous love. Oh, morning stars together claim the holy birth. In praises sing to God our King and peace to men on earth. Let's take a couple stanzas, greet one another, make somebody feel welcome. We'll come back and sing that last stanza together. How silently, how silently the wondrous gift is given. So God imparts to human hearts the blessings of his hand. No ear may hear his coming, but in this world of sin, where meek souls will receive him still, the dear Christ enters in. On that last.
last. Let's sing it together. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. As you find your seats, let's sing that last. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. seated if you will and the ushers will come get our offering tonight make the way to the front once they have that picked up take it from them please okay that's the second time they've spilled all their candy on the floor up here so let's have someone else hold it okay bring it over there and I'm not sure any will be left after it sits <laughs> by Danny Wright was too eager to get that and uh the candy cane that counts, not what's in it, just so you know. But uh, all right, thank you. Thank you for doing that. All right. And Allie, we're kidding. You'll get all your candy too, okay? Don't worry about it. It'll be all right. <laughs> all right. Let's uh, be prepared to give as God's blessed and prosperous. Remember, next Sunday is the Christmas uh, offering towards the electric piano that we want to get for downstairs for the choir to be able to practice and uh, for the material. Uh, that'll help with our missionaries as well down in Honduras, okay? So uh, ask, I hope you're praying and seeing what the Lord would have you do for that special offering uh, next Sunday. All right, let's pray for our offering tonight. Brother Andy, have you prayed? Father, we come to you tonight, and again, we thank you for an opportunity to be in your house. And Lord, we thank you for who you are. And just um, during the season, just celebrating, again, um, the great gift of, you sending your son to earth, looking beyond our faults and seeing our needs for a savior, and you sending that savior to us. Thank you so much for the uh, reminder again with the kids playing, the great job they did, and, and Lord, we just love you. I pray that we would show that love now with our giving and giving back to you of all that you give to us. And Lord, prepare our hearts for the preaching to come, and we'll thank you for it and give you all the praise and glory for you are worthy. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Sally. Take your Bible this evening, if you would. Luke chapter 2, please. For our Luke chapter 2, please. We're going to read verses 8 through 17. Verses 8 through 17 for our scripture reading tonight. We read the verses responsibly. We begin together on verse 8. Then I'll read verse 9. We'll alternate until we... And on verse number 17. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture, please. All of us standing to read God's word and 
Let's begin together on verse 8 of Luke chapter 2. Ready? And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them. And the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for, behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them, into heaven these shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste, and found Mary and Joseph, and the babe lying in a manger. And let's read 17 together also. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And let's pray together, shall we? Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of our scripture here this evening. And Lord, it has been good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Thank you so much for already what we've heard uh, with the play, with the music, and the fellowship together tonight. Thank you for the good spirit that's in this place. And Lord, we're, we're just grateful that you meet with us when we gather together and what you've already done, and we ask you to once again uh, minister to our hearts through the special this evening and prepare our hearts that we'll be ready to receive the truth from your word this evening. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen.
Our Father in heaven, we bow before you in prayer now, and we thank you, Lord, for again the opportunity we have to open up your word together. I pray, Lord, that in the next few minutes you would speak to our hearts as only you can. I pray you'd honor the, the word of God as it is taught this evening, and Holy Spirit, do what only you can do in each one of our hearts and lives. Help us, Lord, to focus. Uh, help us give our attention this evening to the principles and the things that we'll look at from your word tonight, and let us learn some things. and. Maybe be reminded of some things, Lord, that will help us to keep focused on Christ at Christmas time. Lord, use the, the Word of God in each of our lives tonight now, please. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Heart transplants are an increasingly more common today than what they once were. The first heart transplant was given in 1968. Most of you are familiar with the name Dr. Christian Barnard. He was a South African physician, and he transplanted a human heart into do another doctor, Dr. Philip Blayberg. And after the surgery, Dr. Barnard carried the old heart in a plastic box and showed it to the patient. The two doctors sat on his hospital bed, and they examined the scars and the thickening tissues of his old heart. And Dr. Barnard said, Dr. Blayberg, do you realize you're the first man in the history of humankind to sit and look at your own dead heart? It's pretty incredible. Now he received that new heart, and for those of you who don't know, I looked it up, I, I got to thinking, I wonder how long it lasted. But it lasted 19 months and 15 days. It's all the longer that extended Dr. Blayberg's life. And I'm glad that when Jesus gives you a new heart, that it doesn't just last for 19 months and 15 days, amen? But it lasts forever. It's a forever transformation. And you know, when you understand the true meaning of Christmas and you come to understand just who Jesus Christ is, and you receive Him as your Savior, He transforms your heart. And your desires change, and your, 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 your uh, passions change, your focus of Christmas changes, in fact, your life changes. It's, it's not unlike, that's why I think probably the movie Scrooge was so popular. Because as he sees the past, the present, and the future of Christmas, he, he sees, he realizes how, empty and bitter his life has been, how self-centered he's been. And of course, he changes everything, at least for the Christmas that when he comes back. We don't know how long that lasted either. But I know this, when Christ changes your life, it'll last forever. It's not a temporary change, it's a complete change, and it's a permanent change. The birth of Jesus Christ brought about a lot of dramatic changes in people's lives. A lot of people were never the same after the night that he was born. And I'm going to look tonight, just briefly, I'm not going to keep you very long, but I want to look at, at three different people are, uh, that, uh, that their life was changed by the coming of Christ. And maybe they're not directly involved in his birth, but they were surrounding with his birth. And a couple of them were definitely directly involved in the birth. And I want to learn just three principles from these three groups of people that will help us to live by their principles during the Christmas season, all right? Let's look first of all at Luke chapter 1. Would you turn there? Just over a page, hopefully, in your Bible. In Luke chapter 1, we're introduced to a couple. The couple's name is Zachariah and Elizabeth, okay? And uh, Zacharias the priest and his wife Elizabeth faithful followers of the Lord. Verse number 5. There were in the days of Herod, the king of Judah, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah. And his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. Now, that's an amazing commentary because that's not somebody saying that about them, that's the Holy Spirit of God saying that about them. This is not the opinion of man, this was the statement of God about them. Amazing people. But notice verse number 7, they had no what? 
child because Elizabeth was barren, and they both were now well stricken in years. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. When Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. And thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. And he shall be great in the sight of the Lord. He shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And you're great in the sight of the Lord when you don't either. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall return to the Lord their God. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers of the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And Zacharias said to the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I'm an old man. And my wife is well stricken in years. The angel answering said unto him, I'm Gabriel, that stand in the presence of God, and am sent to speak unto thee, and to show thee these glad tidings. And behold, thou shalt be dumb and able and, and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed, because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. Now, here's the Here's the amazing thing. Here's Zachariah and Elizabeth. They're, they're getting up in years now, and, and evidently they had prayed for years to have a child. Most of you know it was just a disgrace for a couple, a married couple and a woman particularly, not to have children. They looked upon that. The fruit of the womb was his reward, and they looked upon that as the blessing of God, and they really felt disgraced uh, uh, not to have a child. And so, uh, the, in fact, the more children they had, the more blessed you were. That's why the Bible says, happy is a man that hath his quiver full of them. All right? And, and so, Zacharias and Elizabeth had grown older, and now they're past the childbearing years. But, and, and they probably, I don't know if, they were, if either one of them was still praying. I'm not sure they were still praying for that. All right? I think they figured it's, the time has passed. Uh, God just didn't want us to have a, a child. But uh, they, they might have thought it just wasn't God's will for us to have children. I, I wonder how many times they had the discussion. I wonder why God didn't hear our prayer. I wonder how come God never gave us any children. And, and the truth of the matter is, God heard their prayer. We know that by reading what the angel here said. Uh, I think it was the angel uh, Gabriel that responded to his prayer. And so he's in the temple offering the incense, the prayers for the people, and they're praying without, and the angel shows up and tells them, your prayer's been heard, you and Elizabeth are going to have a son. And, and Zechariah fi finds it very hard to believe. In fact, he, he kind of tells the angel, and it's always interesting when we try to tell God what our predicament is, and tell God, how, how, uh, d didn't you, don't you remember how old we are? Uh, don't you remember how I'm past, uh, th this just isn't going to happen? Uh, and, and he said, listen, I stand in the presence of God. Gabriel's saying, I'm just the messenger. I'm just sent to tell you what God said. God said it's going to happen. And listen, my friend, when God says it's going to happen, it's going to happen. And God's going to take care of it. And listen, whenever God answers your prayer, it is the right time. Because it's his time. I know sometimes we think that we have to tell God when the deadline is. But you understand, it's never... It's never the wrong time when God answers prayer. It's always the right time because it's his time. Mary and Martha said, Lord, if you'd have been here four days ago, he wouldn't have died. Oh, no, let me ask you a question. Would you rather Jesus been there and kept him from dying, or would you rather say, this is my brother who Jesus brought back from the dead? Huh? How cool was that? Uh, been there to see uh, the resurrection and, and him being alive from the dead. It's always on time. But I wonder, there's no doubt, Zachariah and Elizabeth, of course, you know, he came out of the temple and, of course, he couldn't talk and everybody wondered what was going on and he would have to write, uh, write things down to be able to communicate and uh, he, he, I can't imagine 
what Elizabeth thought. I can't imagine when the word began to spread or when Elizabeth began to show. Can you imagine that? I mean, here's somebody. They may have been married 46 years. I don't know. And uh, could you imagine if, if Cheryl showed up at church and you say, hey, Cheryl, uh, and she said, well, I've been trying to keep it a secret, but John and I are going to have a baby. Huh? <laughs> yeah, that's what, that, don't you think people in town did just what you did? They laughed a little bit and <laughs> snickered some and said, you, really? Huh? Is that possible? Huh? And they, they just, uh, they had to be the talk of the town. It had to be everybody talking and, and wondering. And of course, you know that they were uh, some knowing them would have been happy for them and, and, and thankful that God was doing a miracle. And, and of course, they, they had a great testimony. And they would have been able to say, hey, God answered our prayer. God answered our prayer. And John is going to be, a, oh, you mean Zachariah Jr. No, 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 no. He's not going to be Zach Jr. His name is going to be John because that's what the angel said. And so they named him John. And so if I look at Zachariah and Elizabeth, here's, here's a principle we can learn from them that you ought, to, you ought to always remember. Never give up praying. Never give up praying. How many times? I wonder how many times we, we've been right. God has heard our prayer. God's ready to answer our prayer. And we threw our hands up and said, forget it. Hmm? And we gave up praying. Every time Jesus taught on prayer, he taught about importunity in prayer. He taught about persistence in prayer. He taught about uh, not giving up in prayer, but, but making sure. I, I use the illustration when our children were little, and some of you have these little ones in the play tonight, and, you know, uh, sometimes after church you're standing around talking, and, and they'd come up and they'd pull on my coat. And I'd look down and say, I'm talking to someone right now, just wait. And they, they maybe wait patiently. What they seemed like was eternity. It probably was 20 seconds. And then what do they start doing? Pulling on your coat again. Dad, I said, I'm talking to someone right now. And, and you're talking, and pretty soon, here they are again. And finally, I have to stop and say, just a minute. What do you want? In my sweetest tone, of course. Huh? You know what? I realize they, now, I realize something's important. And so I stop, and I give them my attention. Now, what if they tug on my coat, and I say, I'm talking to someone right now, and I start talking, and then next time I look down, they're gone and off doing something else. What do I think to myself? It must not have been very important. Hmm? So we pray about something, and we may pray for a day or two, and then all of a sudden we're, we're tugging at God's coat, asking God for something, and God says, okay, just a minute. Okay, just a minute. And then he comes the next day, and we're not tugging anymore. We're off doing something else. And God must look at us and say, must not have been very important. Hmm? Must not have been very important. And so it, it, we learn we have to keep on praying. They, they, reached, they reached the end of themselves. Oftentimes, listen, they waited. God waited until it was impossible with men, but it would only be possible with God. That's why God waited, I believe. So they knew that this would be of God, not of man. And maybe God's waiting to answer your prayer just to show you that it has nothing to do with what man can do. It will only have to do with what God can do. And he'll get all the glory for it. Nobody is a self-made person. Everybody is to be a God-made person. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. I read about John D. Rockefeller Sr. He's a good example of a person that had to come to the end of himself before he could get the proper perspective on life. Rockefeller drove himself to achieve one ambition in his life, and that was to make money. Most of you, when I hear that, when I mention the name Rockefeller, that's what, you don't see a face or a name, you see dollar signs in your head when I say the name Rockefeller. Huh? Am I right? At 33, he earned his first million dollars. At age 43, he controlled the biggest company in the world. <clears throat> At age 53, he was the richest man on earth and the world's only billionaire at the time. And he developed a disease. A disease that caused all his hair to fall out, his eyelashes and his eyebrows to disappear, he lost so much weight, he just became skin and bones. 
His weekly income was a million dollars. And he could eat milk and crackers. That's all he could digest. He was so hated in Pennsylvania, he had to have bodyguards night and day. He had a hard time sleeping. He never smiled. He didn't enjoy anything in life. The doctors examined him, and they predicted he had one year to live. One newspaper had already written his obituary, preparing for his death. But one sleepless night, John D. Rockefeller came to his senses. And he realized that he could not take one dime with him into the next world. And he had the revelation that night that money isn't everything. And it changed him. The next morning, he was a different man. He began to help churches with his wealth. He established the Rockefeller Foundation. And their funding of medical research led to the discovery of penicillin. He began to sleep well. He began to eat. He began to enjoy life. And John D. Rockefeller did not die at 54 years of age. He died at 98 years of age. Don't give up on prayer. Don't give up on prayer. I'm talking to people tonight. You've prayed for something and you prayed and you quit. It's time to start praying again. It's time to start going to God again. Zachariah and Elizabeth teach us don't give up on prayer. Obviously, the next couple we're going to look at is the couple who were chosen by the, by the Lord to be the earthly parents to the Lord Jesus. The angel appears to someone else down in verse number 30. Well, let's, let's back up a little bit in verse number 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. The angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. So Gabriel visits her and assures her that she's going to be the earthly mother of the Christ child. And of course Mary said in verse 34, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And and the angel answered and said, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, the power of the eye shall overshadow thee, and that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So she said, Mary, you're going to have the Savior. You're gonna, he's going to be born from you. Now, Jesus what didn't just come into existence in Bethlehem. He, didn't just, he always was. He's God the Son. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. He always was. He's eternal. But he took on human flesh. He took on a body and came to earth and dwelt amongst men. And when he came, he would come and take on our sins in his body when he died on the cross. And and when, listen, Jesus lived the perfect sinless life as a human being. And what Jesus lived on this earth, my friend, he lived as a spirit-filled human being. And if he didn't, We can't follow his example. The Bible says we're to follow his steps. It's in in, uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. We're to follow his steps. We can't do that if we just say, well, of course he did that. He's God. Hello? Or get quiet on me in there, all right? And uh, he was was our example, and we follow his steps. And, And he was a perfect, he's the only one that lived a perfect, sinless life. Yet he went to the cross and he hung there and he bled and he died for my sin, for your sin. Listen, when you put your faith in Christ as your Savior, he took your sin upon him, his perfectness and his righteousness, when you put your faith and trust in him, is put on your account. And I go to heaven not because there's any good in me. 
I go to heaven because his righteousness is upon me. When God looks down at me, he sees the perfectness of Jesus Christ. He sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's the only way you get to heaven, is he has to see you in Christ Jesus. So Mary said, uh, be it unto me uh, as the Lord has said. She said, I don't know how it's going to be possible, but I, I, I want it to be just like you said it was. And uh, she says, I, I believe what you're telling me. I don't have to know how. I just know that if you said, if God says that's what it's going to be, that's the way it's going to be. And, and God, God entrusted that to Mary, and he had to know her, of course, and know her heart, and Joseph as well. And, and he expected them that they would receive it. He expected that they'd be able to hold up when, when they would be the object of ridicule. You can imagine. Here's a couple that's engaged. Espoused basically would be like our engagement. They've been committed to one another. They haven't actually been married yet, but they were, they were promised to one another. And all of a sudden, Mary's got to say, I'm with child. You know from the book of Matthew, Joseph was, wasn't sure what to do. He had the right legally to put her away. Not, not just divorce, but uh, worse than that. He could have her put to death for being unfaithful. And Joseph, while he pondered these things, and that's a great thing about Joseph, he didn't act, he didn't just react to it. He thought on these things. How many, how many times could we save ourselves some trouble if we just stop and think about it first instead of react about it? And while he thought on these things, you read about it in Matthew, God spoke to him in a dream and said, Joseph, don't fear to take Mary to be your wife. That which is conceived in her is from the Holy Ghost. God confirmed that message to him. And Joseph believed it. Joseph believed it. And he knew, listen, he knew their faith in God would be strong enough to stand when no one else was going to believe him. We don't know. The Bible doesn't record much about uh, the, the family members, the people surrounding them. But i got to believe they had a rough time. They're just a young, young couple here. And, and listen, while we live in a day, it's hard for us to fathom because we have people out of wedlock that have children and, and we have people who aren't married and have children. I, I, I don't know what the percentages are now, but I think there's just almost as many children born out of wedlock than there are in marriage. And, and, and so it's kind of a, something we've just come to accept. But it wasn't that so. And some of you are old enough in this room, you remember the day when it wasn't that way in our country either. But it certainly wasn't that way in their day. And so they, they had to face some tremendous opposition and some tremendous ridicule. Tremendous uh, people who, I'm sure, cut them off and said, we don't longer have anything to do with you. We don't want anything to do with you. Yeah, well, this, this baby's from God. Yeah, yeah, sure. You imagine that? And yet they believed what God said. You see, God... Their faith in God and God's trust in them. See, God knew, I'm going to trust them with him, and I believed. God says they're going to have the faith to stay with it. They're going to have the belief to, 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 to hold the line. God had that much confidence in them and their faith in him. It's amazing what, what people can do when you show some confidence in them. When you show some faith in them. I read something earlier. An elementary school teacher named Jean Thompson. She was a fifth grade school teacher. And she helped bring about a great change in one of her students. His name was a little boy named Teddy Stoddard. And Teddy didn't play well with the other children. His clothes were always dirty. He constantly needed a bath. He was kind of a sad and sullen little boy. One day, Mrs. Thompson decided she'd look at his school records, and as she looked in the records, she saw this. His first grade teacher wrote, Teddy's a bright, inquisitive child with a ready laugh. He does his work neatly and with good manners. He's a joy to be around. His second grade teacher wrote, Teddy's an excellent student, well liked by his classmates, but he is troubled because his mother has a terminal illness. And life at home must be a struggle. His third grade teacher wrote, 
Teddy continues to work hard, but his mother's death has been very difficult. And his home life is beginning to affect him. Teddy's fourth grade teacher wrote, Teddy's withdrawn and doesn't show much interest at school. He doesn't have many friends and sometimes he sleeps in class. He's absent so much it could become a problem. Well, it was nearly Christmas time and the children brought presents in for the teacher, all of them wrapped neatly and in colorful paper. And Teddy brought his in, but it was wrapped in a brown paper grocery bag. Mrs. Thompson opened his present and she found a rhinestone bracelet with some stones missing and a bottle of cologne that was about one quarter full. The other children began to laugh. But Mrs. Thompson put the bracelet on and commented to Teddy how pretty it was. She also dabbed some of the perfume on her wrist. After the party that day, Teddy Stoddard stayed behind long enough just to say to her, Mrs. Thompson, today you smell just like my mom used to. When the children left, the teacher cried. The next day, Mrs. Thompson took a new interest in teaching her children, and she worked especially hard with Teddy. And as she worked with him and encouraged him, she, he, become, he seemed to come alive. The more she encouraged him, the faster he responded. By the end of the school year, he'd become one of the smartest children in the class. A year later, she found a note under her door at school from Teddy telling her that of all the teachers, she was his favorite. Six years went by, and she got another note from Teddy. He wrote that he'd finished high school, graduating third in his class, but she was still his favorite teacher. Four years later, she got another letter saying he graduated from college with the highest honors, but he assured Mrs. Thompson that she was still his favorite teacher. Several years later, she received another letter telling how he appreciated her as his teacher and that she was still his favorite, and the letter was signed Theodore F. Stoddard, M.D. A year later, she received a letter stating he was getting married, and he explained that his father had died a few years earlier and wondered if she would come sit in the pew reserved for the mother of the groom. And Mrs. Thompson went and attended his wedding that day, and that day she put on that perfume that smelled just like his mother had smelled many years before. Transformations come when somebody believes in you, when somebody puts confidence in you. Just as God put his confidence in Mary and Joseph, and they took that as a sacred trust, and they, they believed with God all things are possible. That's the state motto of Ohio, isn't it? With God all things are possible. That is exactly how we ought to live. And their life was transformed by faith because they believed with God all things are possible. I don't know, it doesn't say what Joseph's parents thought. It doesn't say what Mary's parents thought. It doesn't say what the relatives thought. I, I'm sure there were trying times. But I wonder how many times that, that, that Mary was reminded of what the angel said in verse 37, with God nothing shall be impossible. And I wonder how many nights she laid her head down and said, with God nothing shall be impossible. And she encouraged herself. I think Zachariah and Elizabeth learn, and we learn from them, never give up on prayer. I think with Mary and Joseph, we learn something about live by faith. Live by faith. Zachariah and Elizabeth never give up on prayer. Never give up on what? Prayer. Joseph and Mary live by faith. Trust God. Believe God. Don't, 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 don't doubt God. With God, all things are possible. There's one more group I want to look at, and that's in chapter 2 where we read this evening. And I think they even talked about it in their play. These are the shepherds out in the field. Verse 8 says they're watching their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord. You always wonder what his name was. It was lo. And 
he came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said, Fear not. Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And of course, they tell them, and then uh, there's a great multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Now watch what the angels did, or, or the shepherds did. It came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven. The shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste. Haste means they came quickly. They came speedily and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning the child. The lowly shepherds experienced a transformation in their lives. You know, they, they probably thought nothing ever happens to a shepherd. I read this account of a shepherd as he's talking. And he said this, Well, it's cold outside tonight. And I'm out in this forsaken place and we're stuck here with a thousand sheep. Life is exciting everywhere else, but the highlight of our day is sleep. Shepherds don't make any profit. We get enough just for room and board. Everybody else seems to wallow in their wealth and we're financially ignored. It's kind of lonely out here. We have a pretty isolated job. And our position is without esteem. We're socially challenged. We're society's outcasts. We're not exactly every woman's dream. Shepherds have a very humble purpose. Few people really care about us. Sometimes I wonder if God even knows we exist. If he does, I'm pretty certain he for, he's forgotten where we are. Nothing ever happens to a shepherd. Life's as boring as boring can be. While exciting things happen all over the world, nothing ever happens to us. Nothing ever happens to us. And then the sky lit up. And the angel appeared. And then a great host of the angels were appeared. And they appeared to shepherds. Now, let me help you understand something about shepherds in that day. Shepherds were not religious. Rabbis ranked them on the same level as prostitutes and habitual sinners. They were outcasts. They were banned from the synagogue. They weren't allowed to go. They were not included in, quote, polite society. Now, if, if you were thinking about denouncing the birth of the Savior of the world, is that the group you'd go to? Pretty incredible. Pretty amazing that God would choose them. And yet he chose the shepherds. The angel said, I'm bringing you tidings of great joy, and I think here's the key, that'll be to all people. All people even the shepherds, even the lowly ones that you think nobody cares about and you think you're neglected by society. The shepherds came immediately and found the baby in the manger, just like the angel said. And I, I'm sure they were, while they were maybe been a little bit confused and a little bit not sure about what they'd seen and even what they'd heard and if it was real, but I tell you, once they got to the, to the stable and they saw the Christ child and they saw Mary and they saw Joseph. Oh, they knew this was real. And they began to praise God. They began to tell everybody the news that God had told them, the angel had announced to them. They were the first to see the Messiah. Mary and Joseph saw him. The next guys to see him were the shepherds. And they saw the Christ child. And they didn't keep it to themselves. They went and told other people about it. And, and, and they, were, they were amazed that they got to see the Savior of the world. They knew who He was because the angels told them who He was. And their bewilderment and their, 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 their confusion turned into wonderment and it turned into praise. The shepherds began to praise God. Hey, can I remember, can we take from the shepherds the principle to keep praising God? To just praise the Lord? When's the last time you just praised God? 
When's the last time you just got yourself somewhere and took out a piece of paper and, and turned it over and just began to write down everything you ought to praise God for? And then just go down the list and just have a fit. I mean, take your socks and shoes off and get on your bed and jump up and down and say, praise the Lord. God's been good to me. And praise Him. You know, it's amazing. We're still talking about shepherds tonight. 2,000 years later. I wonder if those guys, if, if, if they're in heaven, if they, they look at this and say, hey, looky here. We're in the Bible. Huh? Nothing ever happens to shepherds. But looky here. God put us in the Bible. Look, come, come over here. Come over here. Look down there at that church in Grove City. They're talking about us tonight. I think they'd, they'd be thrilled. I think the principle of praise praising God for what they'd seen. What have you seen God do? I wonder how many of us have seen the Savior and known the Savior and we don't tell anybody about it. We keep it to ourselves. Christmas, it, there's no better time of year to tell people about Jesus. I mean, this is what it's about. It is about Jesus Christ. That's what the, the, the old play, they could say, no matter what it is, whether it's an ornament or whether it's a star or whether it's a wreath or whatever it is, a candy cane, you can put it to Jesus and tell him who he is. From Zachariah and Elizabeth, we learn never give up on prayer. From Joseph and Mary, we learn to live by faith. From the shepherds, I learn to be committed to praising the Lord. I want to praise Him for His goodness. I want to praise Him. Hey, I want to praise Him that I've seen what I've seen, that I've heard what I've heard, that, that He saw fit to, to save my soul. Hallelujah. You've heard me say this before. Some of you are in families that have brothers and sisters who aren't saved. How come you're saved? How come God saw fit to save you? Do you ever just praise Him for that? You could be the one who'd be looking at, at your brother or your sister thinking what a nut they are instead of them looking at you thinking what a nut you are. Say, I'm a nut, but I'm screwed on the right bolt. Amen. <laughs> you, just, you, you just believe in Jesus. It's okay. Live by faith. Live committed to praise. It keeps, it keeps Christmas focused on what it's all about. Three people, three different... Zechariah and Elizabeth, Joseph and Mary, and the shepherds. People surrounding the birth of Christ, but some good principles that help us to stay focused on Christ at Christmas. Don't give up on prayer. Live by faith. Trust God. With Him, all things are possible. And be committed to praising Him. Thank Him for what you've seen and what He's done in your life. Let's pray, shall we? Father, Take the truth now this evening. Thank you, Lord, for everyone's attention tonight. Thank you, Lord, for these people who surround the Christmas story, the birth of Jesus. And Lord, the things that we've gleaned tonight from their lives, I look forward to meeting them one day. I'd love to talk to Zachariah and Elizabeth. I'd love to talk to Joseph and Mary. I even look forward to talking to these shepherds about what they felt that night when they saw the angel appear in the sky and then a multitude of the heavenly hosts and how they begin to praise God for what they'd seen and they spread abroad to everybody that Christ was born Lord may we live the principles that we glean from their lives I pray that tonight some folks who maybe have had a burden on their heart and maybe for weeks or months or maybe years they've prayed and they've kind of given up and they learned from Zachariah and Elizabeth that Lord it's, it's never over till you say it's over and I pray that we'd begin to pray again and we'd never give up on our prayer I pray that Mary and Joseph would teach us to live by faith that Lord you've entrusted us with the gospel you entrusted them with your son in a sense, you've entrusted us with your son to tell the world about him. I pray, Lord, we'd be faithful. We would live by faith and not by sight. 
though the world may ridicule us and though others may try to discourage us, we'd be true to what you've called us to do and told us to do and how you've told us to live. Lord, I pray that we'd be committed to praising your name like the shepherds did. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I'll finish praying in just a moment. But I wonder how many believers tonight would say, Preacher, the, one of these principles spoke to my heart tonight. It may be prayer. It may be living by faith, trusting God, believing that with God all things are possible. It might just be praising the Lord. We're all pretty good at complaining. We're probably not all very good at praising the Lord. And I wonder if the Lord has spoken to your heart tonight and you say, you know what, Pastor, the Spirit of God touched my heart tonight. I want you to pray for me this evening. Would you slip your hand up, Christian, and say, pray for me tonight, Pastor? Yes. Amen. Amen. You may put them down. In a moment, I'll pray and we'll have our invitation. God has spoken to your heart. It's time for you to respond to him. Do what he's bidding you to do. Heavenly Father, I thank you for speaking to hearts tonight. I would ask simply that your will be done in each heart and life during this invitation. Thank you for speaking to our hearts, and I pray now we'll respond to what you've told us to do. May holy decisions be made for you tonight that will affect our lives. Allow us to be an influence to others for good and for God. Have your way now in this invitation, and I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, you stand to your feet, please, as you stand to your feet. Our pianist will play as she plays, Brother Bob will sing. As he sings the invitation, God has spoken to your heart. Respond to him tonight. Oh, to Jesus I surrender. All That's right. to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender. I surrender humbly at his feet I bow worldly pleasures all forsaken take me Jesus take me now I surrender all I surrender all all to thee Savior, I surrender all. All to Jesus, I surrender. Make me Savior, holy thine. Let me feel the Holy Spirit. Truly know that thou art mine. I surrender. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you now for this evening. Thank you, Lord, for dealing with our hearts tonight. And thank you, Lord, for just a wonderful day in the house of the Lord. Thank you for decisions that have been made for you today and for Alan following you in believer's baptism this morning. And, Lord, we're asking you now to dismiss us with your care. Make us mindful that you go with us from this place. And, Lord, make us ever mindful of your presence. I pray that we'll please you in all we do this week. Lord, I pray that you'll use us to point others to Christ. Allow us to have this time of year to focus people's attention on the Savior of the world. Now, Father, watch over us. Give everyone safety as they travel, please. Thank you again for a wonderful day. We love you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Uh, we're going to sing our closing song. Um, Leanne has a doctor's appointment in the morning at 840. It's here in Grove City. And if someone could give her a ride, that would be a blessing. Is there anybody available that would be able to, a lady particularly, that would be able to take her? Okay. I, I understand that. I'm trying to get a, I know, I'd rather it not be a man.
I would rather it be a woman to take her. Do you understand that? Okay. That's probably best unless you have a couple. Anybody available for that? Sure could use some help. Brenda, you'll be able to do that? Okay. All right. Brenda Parrish can handle that for you. Okay. Appreciate you fellows being willing. I really do. That's a blessing. If I ever need to go to the doctor, I'll call you. Okay. And uh, amen. Thank you. All right. Let's sing together. It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. Let's sing it together, shall we? It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. It's a grand thing to follow Jesus anywhere and everywhere I go. For it's a grand thing to be a soldier in his army here below. It's the grandest thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. God bless you. You are dismissed.